Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, a new tyrannosaur species has been discovered in Mexico, a new pterosaur species was found in Morocco, some very old Bronze Age cheese DNA has been recovered, and much more. Starting off the news this week, astronomers have published a paper in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics detailing the confirmation of the discovery of a planet that has been detected around the closest single star system to Earth, orbiting around the famous Barnard star. The closest star system to Earth is the Alpha Centauri system, which is home to three separate stars. Barnard's star is a lot smaller than our own sun, clocking in at around 15% of our sun's own mass. There have been some exciting readings to come from Barnard's star in the past, with astronomers thinking they'd found evidence for an exoplanet over three times the mass of Earth back in 2018, but this was not confirmed. And so, this new planet has been named Barnard B, and is a relatively small planet just half the mass of Venus. It also has a much, much quicker orbit than our own planet, lasting just three days. It orbits very close to its host star, being 20 times closer to Barnard's star than Mercury, the closest of our planets to the Sun, is to ours. This may seem like much less of an issue given the much lower mass of Barnard's star, and it is, but it's still far too close to be habitable for life as we know it, with a surface temperature of 125 degrees Celsius, far too hot for liquid water. Despite its limited usefulness to the spacefaring future of humanity, this is still a great discovery and it's very nice to finally confirm a planet around our closest lonely neighbour. Excitingly, this discovery also comes with hints of three other exoplanets around the same star, but these have not been confirmed and none of them would be the large one that was thought to have been found in 2018. In other news, we're sticking to space stuff but zooming in much closer to home as a study published this week in the journal Nature Communications has announced the detection of both carbon dioxide and hydrogen peroxide on the surface of Charon, the largest moon of Pluto. Using data gathered from the James Webb Space Telescope, the team behind this study said the detection of carbon dioxide on the planet was not unexpected and lined up well with the expectations they had. Hydrogen peroxide, however, was less expected and suggested a geological process that had not been foreseen. It suggests an altering of Charon's water-rich surface by external factors, those being ultraviolet light from our own sun, high-energy particles from the solar winds, and charged particles from outside our solar system. Charon has often been a particular interesting target for astronomers because of its primitive composition and the lack of materials that might block more extensive data analysis. This new research could be key to helping scientists understand the origin and evolution of bodies like Charon in the fringes of our solar system. Also, a quick on-theme announcement, World Space Week is almost here. Coordinated by the United Nations, this international celebration of all things space science runs from October 4th to the 10th with many space education and outreach events being run by institutions across the planet. It's a great way to learn more about this fascinating topic and spread a love for space, so do be sure to check what events may be running near you. And if anyone happens to be in the area of South England, then my university, the University of Portsmouth, is running a few events, including a talk on the science of space in movies at the Spinnaker Tower, which Doug and I will both be attending. So be sure to have a look, there are more details in the description. First up in the archaeology news this week, scientists have retrieved ancient cheese DNA. Yes, we are indeed talking about old cheese. In fact, we're talking about the oldest known cheese sample ever found. Extra, extra, extra mature. Cheese is extremely difficult to preserve and so this provides a tantalizing piece of our past. In early human history, little is actually known about how the fermented microbes of cheese were utilized and evolved, but DNA retrieved from 3,500 year old kefir cheese from Xinjiang, China may be able to help solve this. It was previously suggested that kefir was spread from the Northern Caucasus to Europe and other regions, but the researchers have found an additional spreading route from Xinjiang to inland China. This very old cheese was produced by the Bronze Age Xiaohe population. The researchers successfully identified cow and goat mitochondrial DNA in the cheese samples. Interestingly, the ancient Xiaohe people used different animals' milk in different cheese batches. The archaeologists were also able to sequence the bacterial genes in the kefir, providing the opportunity to track 
track how probiotic bacteria have evolved over the past 3,600 years. They found, among other things, that the modern lactobacillus bacteria are less likely to trigger an immune response in the human intestine than in their older counterparts. This suggests that the genetic exchanges helped lactobacillus become more adapted to human hosts over thousands of years of interaction. An unexpected but fascinating story into past human microbial interactions, providing a little more detail into the lives of our ancestors. Next up in the news is the discovery of the first clear links between fossils of the Australian dingo and dogs from East Asia and New Guinea. Archaeological sites at Lake Mungo and Lake Milkengay hold some of the oldest evidence of dingoes in all of Australia. Using radiocarbon dating, researchers have discovered that some remains are over 3,000 years old. The origins of the iconic animal have been debated for over a century. Traditional analysis of dingo specimens typically looked at the size and shape of the animal to trace the dingo's ancestry to South Asia. Previous claims have suggested they evolved from pariah dogs from India or Thailand. However, the new study published in Nature uses sophisticated 3D scanning and geometric morphometrics on ancient dingo specimens to show clearly that they are most similar to Japanese dogs, as well as the singing dogs of New Guinea and the highland wild dog of West Papua. They also found that modern day dingoes are larger and leaner, standing on average 7 to 14 centimeters taller than their ancient ancestors. A brilliant study putting together a little more of the iconic dingoes' origins. And finally in the archaeology news this week, can riding a horse change the way your bones look? In a new study, archaeologists have drawn on a wide range of evidence, from medical studies of modern equestrians to records of human remains across thousands of years to answer this question. And the simple answer is yes. Evidence has suggested horse riding can subtly alter the shape of the hip joint, among other things. But these changes cannot on their own be used to identify whether a person rode horses throughout their life, as many other activities can also change human bones. The earliest confirmed evidence of equestrianism comes from regions around the Ural Mountains of Russia, dating back to around 4,000 years ago, where horses, bridles, and chariots have been uncovered. However, another hypothesis argues that the close relationship between humans and horses began much earlier, near the Black Sea. Recently, scientists have used remains from the Yamnaya culture dating to 5,500 years ago and argued that these people showed evidence of wear and tear in their skeletons that likely came from riding horses. However, this new study disputes this evidence. They explain that bones are not static and change throughout a person's life, and so these clues can be unreliable. Archaeological evidence shows that humans used cattle and donkeys for transport in some areas of Western Asia centuries before they first tamed horses. Ancient peoples likely used these animals to pull carts or two-wheeled vehicles like a chariot. The authors state they have seen similar changes to the bones of nuns who frequently used chariots, and that this evidence alone is not enough to prove equestrianism. Understanding ancient people's lives hinges on when they started to use horses for transport, and so this is a very important study in the piecing together of this puzzle. First up in the paleontology news for this week, we welcome a new species of Tyrannosaur. This dinosaur was discovered in northern Mexico in rocks dating to the late Cretaceous, about 73 million years ago, and it's been named as a new species of the genus Labacania, Labacania aguilani. It's known from a very fragmentary skeleton, with the paleontologists arguing that it represents a separate species from the already named Labacania anomala due to differences in one of the skull bones and the younger age of this new fossil, since Labacania anomala lived at least 2 to 3 million years earlier. Labacania aguilani indicates that in the southern part of the ancient continent of Laramidia, which was the main western landmass of North America during the late Cretaceous, there was actually a distinct lineage of tyrannosaurs compared to the ones inhabiting the more northern region. Regions. Labacania is found to be closely related to Bistahia versa and Dynamoterra from New Mexico, as well as Teratophonius from Utah and an unnamed species from Texas, suggesting that these related species ruled these lands while the north was dominated by the Despletosaurines and the Albertosaurines. Later on in the Cretaceous though, T. rex would of course spread across most of Laramidia. The discovery of different Tyrannosaur lineages inhabiting different regions of the continent at this time indicates that these animals were highly endemic to certain areas. This is somewhat unusual compared to modern large land predators, which generally have, or at least used to have, extensive geographic ranges sometimes spanning continents. 
The authors therefore suggest that carnivorous dinosaur diversity may have been previously underestimated, indicating that there may be many more out there still to be found. Oh, and they also continue to support Nanotyrannus as a valid species. I'm looking forward to the next development in that saga. Anyway, an exciting new dinosaur discovery. Also in the recent news, we welcome a new species of pterosaur from Morocco. This is a new kind of Ornithochirid pterosaur, related to Ornithochirus of Walking with Dinosaurs fame, and it was discovered in rocks that are part of the Chemchem group, which was laid down during the middle section of the Cretaceous period. The Chemchem is most famous for being home to the giant Spinosaurus, Carcharodontosaurus, and other predatory dinosaurs, but there are also many flying pterosaurs known from here too. The new species is named Acarhynchus martilli. The genus name comes from the Arabic for or another, and the Greek for snout, so another snout, which references how many pterosaur snout fragments have been found in the Chemchem. The species name honours Professor David Martil, a paleontologist who has worked extensively on Moroccan fossils, and who also happens to have been my supervisor for my degree. He's also appeared in a few episodes of Seven Days of Science, most recently talking about the new dinosaur Comptonatus. Acarhynchus, as the name suggests, is known from a fragment of the front part of the upper jaw, preserving several tooth sockets and other features, enabling paleontologists to identify this as a new ornithochirid. The naming of the species now brings the number of pterosaurs known in the Chemchem to 10, with five of them being ornithochirids. This makes it one of the most diverse pterosaur assemblages on the planet, as well as the most diverse assemblage found in a river setting. Another great new discovery this week. And finally for this week's news, we have a new species of very ancient dinosauromorph. This animal comes from mid to late Triassic aged rocks in southern Brazil, between about 242 and 235 million years ago. It's a kind of animal called a Silosaurid, which is a very important group for working out the origin of dinosaurs, as they may be the closest relatives to them. Alternatively, recent studies have found that Silosaurs may actually be Triassic Ornithischians, so actual dinosaurs themselves, and precursors to the groups that would one day give rise to Triceratops, Stegosaurus, and many others. This new species is named Gondwanax pariasensis, and is known from a decent amount of the skeleton, preserving many significant features. These features include the number of vertebrae in the hip region, of which Gondwanax has three rather than the two that early cytosaurs would be expected to have, and also the hind limbs. The hip and limb anatomy together suggest that Gondwanax had a unique way of moving about for a cytosaurid, and since it was discovered in the same geological formation as another Silosaurid, called Garmatavus, they may have had distinct behaviours leading to niche partitioning to avoid competition for resources in their shared environment. It's another fantastic discovery this week, providing us with more data on these remarkable possible dinosaurs and how they lived. Well, that's it for the news this week. I hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science, and be sure to follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Benji Thomas if you like, for more short form videos about science news and extinct animals, plus general life updates from me and the 7 Days of Science crew. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.